Coming to you from the Cat House South Studio in Race City, USA. This is episode three of the Cat House Hollywood Podcast. I am Ricky Rackman. Currently, I am on tour. I guess depending on when you're listening to this, right? Like if you're listening to this in March and April, I can tell you that I'm going around America doing my one-man show, One Foot in the Gutter. I get up on stage in these small clubs and theaters, and I tell unbelievable stories from the Cat House, from the old TV show I used to host, Headbangers Ball, and a lot more. Uh, the show's been getting great reviews. I know in the 29th of March, I'm in Annapolis, Maryland, and Leesburg, Virginia. I've got shows in New York. April 7th, I'm playing on Broadway, okay? So please get your tickets. We've got tickets shows in North Carolina, Hobart, Indiana, uh, Milwaukee, Chicago, all over the place. In June, I'm going to be doing my show in Australia. If you want to find out where I'm playing, just go to cathousehollywood.com. That's cathousehollywood.com. And get your tickets and join me for One Foot in the Gutter. I know I wouldn't be doing One Foot in the Gutter if it wasn't for my time hosting Headbangers Ball on MTV. And I would never have been the host of Headbangers Ball on MTV if it wasn't for a club that I opened called The Cat House. And there never, ever would have been a cat house if it wasn't for Tammy Down, the singer of the band Faster Pussycat. Tammy and I were roommates in the 80s, and we had this crazy idea to open up a rock and roll dance club. Not with live bands, just dancing to rock and roll. The reason that Tammy and I opened the cat house is because we wanted a place we could get free drinks we could party with all our friends and not have to clean up the next morning. And the truth is, and it sounds so cliche to say it now, we did it because we wanted to meet girls. And the cat house was that and so much more. The cat house ended up allowing a few live bands to play. Bands you've probably heard of like Alice Cooper, Guns N' Roses, Pearl Jam, Alice in Chains, White Zombie, Megadeth, Motorhead. Primus, geez, the list, the list goes on. But it wasn't the bands that played at the Cat House that truly made it world famous. In future episodes of the Cat House Hollywood podcast, I'm going to take you into the club when the Cat House was open. But today, we need to go before the Cat House was open. Today, I want to take you around Hollywood, check out the rainbow, and most importantly, tell you the story about when Ricky met Tane. The Cat House Hollywood Podcast is brought to you by Cat House Coffee. Of course it is. Do you like coffee? Do you like fresh coffee? Have you even had fresh coffee before? Let me tell you about Cat House Coffee. Yeah, I get really excited, and it's not only because I own half of this company and Leah Vendetta owns the other half. The reason that I'm excited about this is it's really good coffee. It's not some like licensing deal where we just throw the cat house name on a bag of coffee. No, we are there for the roasting. We take it from the roaster to our office, put stickers on the bags, and ship it out fresh to you. When you get your bag of cat house coffee, it was probably only roasted a few days ago. And let me tell you something. Fresh coffee really makes a difference. It's a specialty coffee. It's craft roasted. It's 100% Arabica. And it's going to be your new favorite coffee. To order Cat House Coffee, go to cathousecoffee.com. The Cat House opened in September of 1986. This is before bands like Guns N' Roses ever released a record. When you put it in that context, it does seem like a long time ago. I'm going to go back even further. Before anyone ever walked up, the rotted, moldy stairs that led to the upstairs bar of Ricky and Tammy's Cat House. A matter of fact, it's March 1986, and I had never even met the guy that eventually would start the band Faster Pussycat. The guy that was not only my roommate, partner in grime, brother from another mother, but to this day, my best friend, Tammy Down. In March 1986, gas was 89 cents. The space shuttle Challenger had exploded two months ago, killing all seven astronauts. Top Gun and Platoon were big movies in the theaters, 
the first Legend of Zelda video game was released. In March of 1986, Van Halen started the 5150 tour. First show with Sammy Hagar singing. In March of 1986, Cliff Burton was still alive and in Metallica. We didn't have cell phones. We didn't have computers. Yeah, it was a really long time ago. Dance clubs in Los Angeles were really big in the 80s. In L.A., a local promoter would take over a club for a night, promote it, make flyers, book the DJ, doorman, and it was their club. You might go on a Thursday when a certain promoter ran the club, and the line would be around the block. Next night, a different promoter, and it was a ghost town. There were hip-hop clubs, goth clubs, new wave clubs, top 40 clubs. The clubs would be really hot, then die out in a year or so, many times less than that. Each club would have a DJ. Those DJs may go from venue to venue during the week and many times built up quite a following. I know this because I was one of the DJs. And a DJ in those days meant showing up when the club hadn't opened yet, carrying three to four heavy milk crates of vinyl records. No, not CDs, not a laptop with a USB. Those guys aren't really DJs. Yeah, I was a club DJ carrying records. I worked the Los Angeles dance club circuit. Monday nights, I was the DJ at La Hot Club. I'd start with a huge goblet full of whiskey and play, well, dance music. Dance music for white people. For white people that did cocaine and went to Laker games. I'd play Rock Me Amadeus from Falco or West End Girls by the Pet Shop Boys. Word Up from Cameo. I played dance music. And I'm not going to lie, I liked some of the new wave bands of that era. But I was still a rocker, just not in the rock scene. I didn't even have many rocker friends. I remember one night at La Hot Club, 1984, maybe 85. There was this girl named Angela Nicoletti. She was the hot, crazy chick in high school. I mean, we were kids, but even in her early teens, she knew rock stars. But she was also very popular among the people in the dance clubs. Angela would come into the hot club, work the room, while her boyfriend would hang out with me in the DJ booth. He was a rocker and felt out of place, so he would find sanctuary with me drinking and talking about rock and punk and this band he was in called Hollywood Rose. I'd run into Izzy again a few years later after he had started Guns N' Roses. Other than the hot club, I'd DJ at Walla. Sometimes I'd help MC their bikini contests. I remember thinking those contests were pretty cheesy back then, but the women were fairly outstanding. It was ironic that I would roll my eyes at how degrading it was, and then I'd end up dating a few of them. One of the girls who also worked as a mud wrestler at the Tropicana was named Robbie. I remember her telling me about this cool scenester guy she had met. He had black nail polish. She showed me his business card, which had a picture of Marilyn Monroe, and then said, Tame me down if you can. It was six months before I ever met Tammy. Other than La Hot Club and Walla, there was another club I have yet to mention. I was not only the DJ, but I was also a co-promoter. Friday nights, it was ICE. ICE was located at 836 North Highland in West Hollywood. The club was actually called Probe, a hardcore gay bar. But it wasn't open on Friday night, so it was perfect for ICE. The probe would eventually become the home of Cat House in August of 1987. For a dance club, ICE was pretty cool. Maybe I'd throw in ACDC back in black, but my job was to keep the dance floor packed. So in addition to being the DJ at ICE, I promoted the club, which meant passing out flyers to lure people to come to the club. ICE was on Highland and one block away from Melrose. In the 80s, Melrose Avenue had everything you needed if you were part of the underground rock, goth, art, punk scene. A killer record store called Vinyl Fetish, run by Henry and Joseph Brooks. Joseph would eventually become the DJ at Cat House, and he was very influential in Guns N' Roses getting a record deal. Also on Melrose, you had cool clothing stores for those that liked to live on the edge, or at least dress like they did. Flip, Let It Rock, Poser, and Retail Slut. Retail Slut opened in 1983 by Helen O'Neill. Despite it specializing in attire for the outcasts, Meryl Streep, Madonna, Robin Williams all shopped at Retail Slut. One of Retail Slut's employees was a Seattle transplant by the name Tamey Down.
Back in 1985 is when I got uh, two jobs in one day, working at uh, the Troubadour at night and Retail Slut down on Melrose during the day. Retail Slut was fun because we had all our friends working at the different stores like Jet Rag, Let It Rock, um, Flash Feet, and Vinyl Fetish. It was like, <clears throat> it was the hangout for this rock and roll scene. At night you're out at bars, it's a rainbow, and the Roxy and the whiskey, and during the day you're hanging out on Melrose. So it was a lot of fun. A lot of people come through, Michael Jackson. I remember selling Slash his first hat. He says he stole it, but he knows what happened. It was, it was a lot of fun. There was a lot of crazy stuff that went on down there during that time. One of the benefits of working at a store with a constant flow of customers is you meet a lot of people. And in between the fitting of a new pair of red vinyl pants, you can tell the customers about the first live performance of your new band. And that's what Tammy did. Because in a few weeks at the Central, which later became the Viper Room, Tammy would play the first show with his band, Faster Pussycat. The rock scene was quickly becoming hip in Los Angeles in the 80s. Punk rock was dying. And a lot of that was brought on by clubs not wanting to book punk bands in fear of the type of crowd they might bring. There was heavy metal pizza places like Mazzotti's in Huntington Beach, the famous Rainbow on the Sunset Strip. Everybody back then went to the Rainbow. Even the supermarket became known as Rock and Roll Ralph's. There was a hair salon called Long Hair Rocks, and you could get your haystack haircut while listening to bands like Dawkin or Rat. Trina Ortegon worked at Long Hair Rocks. Trina was dating my friend Keith Cooper. I was dating Trina's friend Cindy, who was another one of the Tropicana mud wrestling girls. We decided to have a birthday party at the Rainbow. So we were able to get a great booth, have a big birthday party, see all the rock and roll stars, and hang out. We also had booked a hotel room back off of Highland Avenue and near Franklin. We decided to have the after party at the hotel, and we would invite everybody. We'd, we'd been hanging out at the Rainbow for a little while, and some people were showing up and sitting in our booth and sharing their time. One of the people that showed up was Tammy. He was promoting his show. He was going to have his first gig with Faster Pussycat. We invited Tammy and several others to our after party at the hotel. If you are a rock historian and have been to Hollywood, you have more than likely been to the Rainbow Bar and Grill, which is on the Sunset Strip right next to the Roxy, which is down the street from the Whiskey, which is across the street from the Viper Room. All the rockers went to the Rainbow. It's been that way for decades. The Rainbow was a hangout for rock musicians and groupies way back in the 70s when you could see Keith Moon, Alice Cooper, John Lennon, Ringo Starr, even Neil Diamond and Elvis Presley went to the Rainbow. If you wanted to see Lemmy from Motorhead, you could find him at the Rainbow Bar with a Jack and Coke. So Trina's party was at the Bow. But I wasn't there because that night I was the DJ for a dance night at the world famous Whiskey A Go Go. As the night was winding down, Trina and Cindy decided to leave the rainbow, grab me, and bring me to their after party. There were always after parties back then. The clubs may close it too, but many times our last drink coincided with the sun coming up. While we were hanging out at the rainbow and everybody was doing their thing, Cindy and I took a little jaunt down the street. We went in for a quick little visit, drove to the back of the Roxy loaded your gear, and took you back over to the hotel with us, where later Keith showed up, who I was dating at the time. Keith Cooper is my oldest friend. We went to high school together. We weren't really friends in high school. I was a punker, and he was sort of the jock type. But somehow, during our new wave, Rockabilly, Duran Duran, Motley Crue phase, we became friends. I have to come clean. Yes, I had big, poofy, long hair. But I really didn't have many friends in the rock scene. I wasn't part of the rock scene, actually. Keith was even more removed than I was. We were a couple of kids from the suburbs in Los Angeles. Ricky was dating her friend Cindy, and we went to this party. It was Trina's birthday at a, at a hotel in Hollywood in the Cuenca Pass. And we showed up there, and of course there was a bunch of these uh, rocker-looking people, that city-looking rockers. Uh, and one of them, the, the, the dirtiest, grungiest, uh, gothic-looking one of all, was this guy, Tammy. And we had met him, and uh, again, he was, he was just so goth-looking and totally unlike anyone that we associated with at the time. And it was a little intimidating. And, uh, but he turned out to be a great guy, and Ricky was chatting him up, and we all had fun, and we hung out. Tammy was there really trying to promote his show. So you could see the two of you 
<clears throat> I'm going to tell you, the two of you started hitting it off, and you and Tammy are conspiring in the corner, cracking up, promoting one another right off the bat, hooking up like you're Lucy and Ethel. Rock and roll history right there. I had to talk to other people regarding this night because, honestly, I can't remember much. And to be honest, Tammy wasn't much better. But I remember meeting meeting Ricky and Keith. I just remember we were drunk. I, to blur it so far back, you know, I'm old. <laughs> so, I don't know. But I remember meeting him and uh, him giving me a flyer for a, a club called Ice. It's a blur. We were kids and drunk. So, that's all I got it can really remember about that. At some point, Ricky said, hey, I run this club called Ice, and you should come by. And uh, and so Ricky said, just come see Keith, and he runs the door, and you know, we'll, we'll create a, a code word. And I remember we were watching this movie at the time, like 3 o'clock in the morning, and it was some stupid B movie, a black and white. Don't even remember what it was about. All I remember, it was, there was like a prison riot with a bunch of guys with shaved heads. And Ricky, being Ricky, looked at the TV, said, okay, the code word is... Bald men behind bars. The only thing Tammy, Keith, Trina, and myself could recall was that there was endless booze and something about bald men behind bars. We were watching some old movie. It had a jailbreak in it, a bunch of prisoners, and they were all bald. I told Tammy that night to come to my club, Ice, and go up to the doorman and say, bald men behind bars. Okay, it seemed funny at the time. Keith Cooper worked the door at ICE. This, again, this scary looking rocker dude shows up and I did not admittedly have immediate recollection of him, but he comes up to me with this very sincere, innocent look on his face and he said nothing other than bald men behind bars. And immediately, I'm like, it, it all, I had this flashback. And, uh, of course, I, I let him in, and he went inside, and, and Ricky hung out with him the rest of the night. And uh, at that point in time, uh, Tammy invited us. He was playing his first show, I think, uh, in Los Angeles. And uh, we went, and Ricky and Tammy started talking and hanging out. And um, it was really from that night that the Cat House was born, because Ricky came up with the idea for the Cat House, which seemed odd at the time, I might add. Uh, a rock and roll dance club, uh, but rock, Ricky needed a, an authentic rocker to to validate the club as a rock club, and Tammy was that guy. And they started talking about it, and uh, it was a perfect fit and a perfect marriage. And it was from there that the uh, greatest rock and roll club in history was born um, that night, that very night. So I saw Faster Pussycat play that first show. It was at the Central. About fifty people were there, which means the place was almost full. I thought they were raw, had that gutter feel for sure. Eventually, they'd get signed to Electra Records. Their debut album was released in 1987. In addition to Bathroom Wall, it had a song called Cat House. There was a Beastie Boyish song called Babylon that featured my DJ skills when I did the scratching on the track. Two years later, Faster Pussycat recorded their most successful album, Wake Me When It's Over. That album went gold and had a single, House of Pain. Keith would eventually become the doorman at Cat House. He started his own clubs, Cabaret and the very successful Camp Hollywood. Keith then dropped out of the scene for a little bit, went to law school, but is now a successful attorney living in Los Angeles, and he's married to Allison, a girl that he met at the Cat House, and Keith is still a very good friend of mine. It's still a trip to me that Tammy and I opened the Cat House over four decades ago, and it's mind-blowing that I can pick up pretty much any book about the 80s and 90s rock and roll scene and somewhere in it there are stories about the cat house only a few of those stories are true to find out what really happened at the cat house you got to keep on listening to future episodes of the cat house hollywood podcast or even better (laughs) come to my show one foot in the gutter it's an evening of unbelievably true stories of rock and roll sleaze and debauchery The reviews on the show is great, and I really want you to go there. I'm going to tell you some dates really quickly. March 29th, I'm in Annapolis, Maryland. Then March 30th, Leesburg, Virginia. April Fool's Day, New Bedford, Mass. Then April 2nd, Bethlehem, PA. April 4th, Pittsburgh, PA. April 5th, I'm in Mechanicsburg. April 6th, I'm at the Starland Ballroom in New Jersey Big Show. 
And then April 7th, I'm on Broadway. I'm on Broadway. <laughs> oh, my God. I'm so excited about that. That's at the Iridium. Uh, I've got shows in May in North Carolina, Kentucky, Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Georgia. Just saying that is, is surreal because I'm so happy to be doing these shows. And I'm so happy when I hear how much fun people have because it's, it's quite unique. And I think you'll have a real good time if you go to the show. To find out what clubs I'm playing at and to get tickets, go to cathousehollywood.com. And remember, that's also a place where you can get cat house shirts or headbangers ball shirts. I guess it's time for me to go. Hope you had a good time. I'm Ricky Rackman. Remember to keep one foot in the gutter, one fist in the gold.